grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, last week was Super Bowl. And I'm not a real sports guy, those kind of things, but uh, I did go home and watch it. And um, I have a little antenna that you can hook up. And that's the only way I can watch it. It's one of those uh, digital antennas now that they have, just like a little wire that comes out of the TV. And you're blessed that I was not at your party if you had a Super Bowl party because I would have been a real party pooper. I started out with a stopwatch. So I wanted to time how much of the Super Bowl was spent on advertisements. And I found out it was about almost two hours were on the advertisements. And uh, so I was pushing the buttons and stopping and starting and watching the Super Bowl. It was a pretty interesting game. Um, one of the things about it that really was kind of shocking, I did some research um, about the cost of tickets. And at Seat Geek, the cheapest ticket was $6,640. The average resale ticket was $12,240. And the lowest price at Ticketmaster was $7,199. The most expensive ticket was more than $62,000 at SeatGeek. And I would have let you come to my house. You could have watched it for just a couple thousand. <laughs> and the advertisements, it, it, there are so many things. It's like offering us the wonderful life. If we just have all these things, we have the right companies that we get our internet from or our phone system or, you know, every, just like a billionaire, one of the things, one of the advertisements said, or shop like a billionaire. Uh, the glories of the couch potato life, which used to be something that we didn't want to be called a couch potato. But now they had all these giant like couch potatoes on the couch, like as though it was like really a good thing to be a couch potato. And there's another, like with scratchers, a little play can make your day. And with the Bud Light advertisement, which I think they're trying to redeem it after the Dylan Mulvaney fiasco. Um, and I don't know, maybe that whole thing was just to uh, make their stock go way down. And then everybody buys their stock because they know it's going to eventually go back up. And then when it goes back up, then they're like, woohoo. Now look at this. Because I saw a lot of people in, at the market still buying Bud Light. So it apparently it didn't hurt them too much. Um, it could have been that they've just got millions and millions of dollars of free advertising. I don't know. Then there was the He Gets Us campaign. This campaign spent uh, over $100 million on advertising. And I think even at the, um, the Super Bowl advertisements that they had was over $10 million that they paid for that. And really, the, the whole um, emphasis of that campaign is to rescue the reputation of Jesus. So one of the things that they showed was, um, like at an abortion clinic, and there's somebody out there washing the feet of a young girl, which apparently had just come out after getting an abortion, and then in the background, you see people who are protesting the abortion clinic. So it's a little bit different emphasis. And it didn't talk about who our Lord Jesus Christ is and what he did for us to give his life for our salvation. He came into the world with a specific purpose. So the Super Bowl made a lot of promises. All those advertisements were how we can have a good life, how we can enjoy life and be happy. And everybody was so happy in those advertisements. That's what they want us to go for. Buy those products. We think we're going to find happiness in that. Something was written in the 19th century that I want to read to you by a very famous person, which I'll tell you after I read it. He said this, Happiness does not dwell in palaces. It dwells in hearts. Though you give a person all the riches of the earth, you will not make him happy. It is a mania which, with which nearly everyone is affected to think, if we only had as much as others, we would be happy also. Cares come with riches. 
Go from castle to castle. Enter the rooms where princes and emperors dwell, and you will see how happy they are. You will find that if Christian faith were wanting, they are unhappy, notwithstanding the power, the riches, and the honors which they enjoy. Happiness is not found in these things. We simply imagine it. Happiness depends upon the condition of the mind. And if you would fill a man's house with gold and diamonds, that would never satisfy the heart. It has wants of a different character. You know, you may have heard about how our heart, hearts all crying out for God, and we don't even know. We try to fill it with other things. The only thing that really will fill our needs is the forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus our Lord and a reconciliation with the Father. That was written, what I had read, from a book, a little booklet called Communism and Socialism by C.F.W. Walter, who was the founder of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. So I have, a, there's a paper, should be in your bulletin. And if you have an ink pen or a pencil or something, you may fill that out as we go through it. Uh, or you may take it home or whatever you want to do with that. Um, but there are three truths about the baptism of Jesus. One, it was revelatory. John appeared baptizing, and this is in your paper, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of what? Anybody know? Repentance. A baptism of repentance for what? For the forgiveness of sins. That's in Mark 1, 4. It was revealed that baptism was calling people to repentance and receiving the forgiveness of sins. From our gospel reading today in verses uh, 10 and 11, another one that's on your paper. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit, not a Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. So we see here revealed the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all present there at the baptism of our Lord. The next day he saw Jesus coming. It's from John chapter 1. Talking about the baptism of Jesus. And where John was there proclaiming. And when he saw Jesus coming toward him and, and said, Behold, what? The Lamb of God. Who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed. Jesus was revealed to Israel, the promised Messiah. He was revealed as a lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The second point to be made was it was statutory. It was a fulfillment of a lot of things, the baptism. It was um, a decided, controlled, and required thing. The promises to Abraham were fulfilled in Jesus. We read about that in our reading this morning, the promises to Abraham. Um, it followed through on the promises by being for all nations, Male and female also with circumcision. That was for males only, obviously. But now for all nations, not just the Hebrew children, the, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but for all nations and for male and female also. In Genesis 22, verses 15 through 18, And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. Picture of Jesus. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies, and in your offspring shall be shall shall all the 
nations of the earth be blessed. All the nations of the earth, because you have obeyed my voice. Then we go to Galatians in chapter 3. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings. It doesn't say to a plural, offsprings. Referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. Referring to Christ, the promises were all in Christ, even in the days of Abraham. What the Lord said to him was about Christ. That is what I mean, the law which came 430 years afterward through Moses, 430 years later after Abraham. So Abraham and the faith of Abraham is primary. You know, we talk about justification by grace through faith. That's not a new thing that started at the Reformation. That started 430 years before the law came through Moses. It does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promises void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it is no longer comes by promises. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So after the baptism of Jesus, you may notice that, that uh, circumcision was no longer emphasized. Baptism was opened up for, for all people, all ethnic groups, all nations. It was the new sacrament that God gave to the church. You know, as it, infants, male infants were circumcised when they were eight days old. So now, baptized, and some people say, well, you can't baptize infants. Well, I don't know, they, for how many thousand years did they circumcise infants? Started with Abraham in his day. So those who have problems with it, I think really they have problems with, with Scripture, but that's what they've been taught. I was at that place when I first became a Christian because I had, didn't really know the Scriptures, and so I thought that seemed like I mean, how can a baby you, you have all this rationalization about it? Well, you can do the same thing with circumcision. You can have the same rationalization, but that's what God said to do specifically for infants. And we know that infants were baptized in the New Testament, where we see that uh, in the book of Acts, where whole households were baptized. They didn't have birth control like today. They had many children. So when they baptized a whole household, there could be a grandma and grandpa there and, and the children and the grandchildren, everybody under one household, which in most every case would include, include infants and children. So it was moved to baptism as the, the uh, sacrament of entry into the Lord's hands as his children. And the third thing is, was preparatory. Jesus tells us we will suffer in this life, but that he has gone before us and he keeps every one of his promises to us. Matthew 4 and verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He went through it before us. He suffered for our sakes and also as an example of how you could go through suffering, still trusting God with everything that we went through and knowing that God is, is in control and that there's something better that he has for us than this world and all the sufferings of this world, which are many. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, this is not in your, your paper, but it says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Then in Hebrews chapter 2, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest, in the service of God, to make propitiation. That's in the English Standard Version, uses the word propitiation, 
for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So he's there for us. Maybe the best way to explain what propitiation means is to just go through how the dis- different uh, versions uh, interpret that verse, that word that is uh, propitiation. English Standard Version is propitiation. The New International Version, to make atonement. In the New Living Translation, to offer a sacrifice. The King James Version, to make reconciliation. And the New King James Version changes a little bit to make propitiation. The New American Standard Version to make propitiation. And the Contemporary English Version to sacrifice himself. And then the most amplified of all is the Amplified Bible that says to make atonement, propitiation, satisfying divine justice, providing a way of reconciliation. So through Jesus that we come back to God, that we find our salvation, our reconciliation, the forgiveness of our sins, and a relationship with him, personal relationship with our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the only true God. That's the only place, the Super Bowl with all its promises and those advertisements and everything, even those who, who just were so looking forward to their team winning. And then I, I felt kind of sorry for those who were for the 49ers because and after they, with all the, the graffiti and everything falling out of the air and all the, the players were sitting there on their bench. And I didn't even know until 20 minutes before halftime that the 49ers were wearing white. I thought the 49ers were red. So. But they were there, sad, despondent. I'm sure a lot of people were rooting for them and really excited, thinking they were going to win, and then all of a sudden, boom, touchdown for the other team. And then, ah, uh, so I feel bad for you, <laughs> but you're still winners in Christ. Because he came into the world for you. So even though we lose often in this world, but yet we're winners in Jesus. So in a big sense, he gets us. But not as as portrayed in the advertisements. He knows we are sinners and he calls us to repentance and to turning to him for the forgiveness of our sins. That's a message that we must digest for ourselves and we must bring to the nations. Next verse is Romans 6, 4. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So when our baptism, we are ushered into a life of death to ourselves and life unto our Lord Jesus Christ what our expectations should be is that we're going to have a lot of suffering in this world. It's part of this promises. This world is full of suffering. And I I deal with a lot of people who are are suffering. That's been kind of my heart for people who are suffering. And one thing that, that makes it hardest for people who are suffering is their expectations. I've seen some who, and then there's some teaching from pulpits is that we should expect to not have this. We, we're supposed to have money and we're supposed to have health and we're supposed to have all these things. And then they build up an expectation among the people of God. And then when the people, of things go wrong, people, what happened? Oh no, I'm, what? And people even question their salvation because of this false teaching. But we will have suffering. Don't think, it's not a strange thing. The temptations and the, sufferings and the things that we go through in this world. Our expectations should be that we will suffer, but Jesus will be with us in the suffering and we will be with him. We have a fellowship with him and his sufferings that he went through for us, for our sakes. Somebody said to me, in fact, I was visiting them this past week, brought them communion and they they made a statement (laughs) I told him I was going to put it in the sermon. It says, for the repentant 
who turn to Christ for salvation, this is the only hell we're going to go through. And for the unrepentant, I, I revised it a little bit. For the unrepentant person who refuses Christ as Savior, this is the only heaven they were ever going to go through. Ooh, that's, that's sad. Everybody needs to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The one who came into the world for our sakes so that we could be reconciled to the Father. In Romans 8, I'm going to finish with this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Amen.